How was the trip? It was good. Uh, it was um, very busy, and it was a very interesting time to be in Islamabad. Because it was my la the, day I, the day I left was like the 30 day mark, but other than that. Uh, so Gaji was just doing uh, a lot of fun. It was heartbreaking to see Islamabad in this In this shape, yeah. But then also going to Gaji, because I had not been in Gaji since 2009. Oh, so okay. Okay. I think I'm on after the break, right? You, you sorry? I'm on after, like here, or? You're the last speaker, right? You're right here. Okay, so there's another coffee break in between. Right, so there's these, then the coffee break, then Irfan and you. Sorry, this, I think, uh, yeah, yeah, said I know. you had I had to, to leave. Yeah, I had to leave at home. Um, so you're here. Okay, perfect. All right, so I was and just wondering if, in case this discussion. doesn't work now, I can fix it in the coffee okay, break. Okay, huh, yeah. that's fine, that's fine. Great. Most people are very frustrated with them. Yeah, no, I think that there is, uh, that there is the education double checking to make sure that his everything is working. And I think when I spoke to the folks at the Global Partnership for Education here, because they're the ones that are providing them a grant for the institute to implement parts of it, they, I don't think they understand the cost benefit analysis part of it. You need to pick and choose what you can do. You can't do everything. What the methodology they use to um, to decide, you know, what they do first and what they do second. second. There's not. Yeah. So I think it's it's a good first step. Uh, first step in your area. Oh yeah, no, like you know, they were notorious for the five-year period. Uh, yes, I'm fine. I can. Uh, yeah. Hi. Thanks. I don't know about it. Heads up. Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Michael Kugelman. I'm the Senior Associate for South Asia with the Wilson Center's Asia Program. Uh, really appreciate you all coming to what promises to be a very fascinating and enriching and hopefully uh, an inspiring day. Uh, I'd like to extend a special welcome to those tuning in via our live webcast. Um, really happy that we could arrange for that so that people outside of D.C. and uh, around the world, including in Pakistan, of course, hopefully can tune in. Let me just say a brief word about the Wilson Center. We are the official memorial to President Woodrow Wilson, who was the only U.S. president to have held a Ph.D. The Wilson Center is a nonpartisan policy, uh, well, the, the Wilson Center is a nonpartisan poli non -partisan policy forum that emphasizes independent research and open dialogue to inform Congress, the administration, and the broader policy community. When one uh, talks about challenges in Pakistan, there is unfortunately so much to talk about. Uh, one could talk about poverty, and unemployment, militancy, public health, corruption, and yet these and, and so many other challenges in Pakistan are exacerbated by an additional challenge, a critical one that requires immediate attention, and that is education, the focus of our conference uh, today. What I think is so important about this event is not just the topic itself, but also the fact that we will be emphasizing solutions-focused debate. This event will not necessarily be about diagnosing the problem and highlighting its symptoms, but rather about presenting realistic and hopefully actionable solutions to a condition that has become very chronic and arguably very dangerous. 
I and the Wilson Center are delighted to be partnering with the Citizens Foundation today. I imagine that everyone in this room is uh, well aware of the extraordinary work that TCF has done in Pakistan uh, with schools and education. And so when presented with the opportunity to partner with TCF on an event on education reform in Pakistan, it was really a, uh, a no-brainer for us. So I'm very grateful uh, to uh, TCF, to Daniel Narani, above all else who's over there, and all of his colleagues, his TCF colleagues, for working with us on this conference. And I should say that it is TCF that really deserves the lion's share of the credit for what you will be experiencing today. Um, in a moment, I will invite Amjad Narani up here to uh, set the stage for our discussions. But first, uh, as the institutional host, just need to dispense with a few <coughs> housekeeping notes. Uh, as, as you've seen on the agenda, we will run until around 4 p.m. We do hope you'll be able to stay with us for the duration of the day. Uh, refreshments will be served during breaks and lunch, all right outside where the breakfast is set up now. Uh, there are restrooms right down this way, down the hall. Uh, and if you need wireless, the uh, password and the wireless info is on the wall over there and over there. And finally, for those of you who would like to live tweet this event, we strongly encourage you to do that. Um, and we request that you use the hashtag Pakistan Ed Crisis, all one word. So with that, I uh, thank you and w invite uh, Amjad Narani to come up here. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for that uh, very nice um, welcome to our guests and speakers. And on behalf of TCF and myself, I once again welcome our distinguished speakers and presenters this morning. Um, you will be listening to some very valuable ideas and uh, remarks from them, I'm sure. Uh, some of our speakers have come from Pakistan and uh, they will be introduced uh, just before they present by our moderators. We certainly thank the, the Wilson Center and Michael and his uh, team for uh, co-hosting with us uh, this first education reform conference that we are organizing here. And I say first because we have plans to have subsequent education conferences as well. Is there a spot for Irfan this morning? Okay, um, again, just a reminder to please make sure that the cell phones don't disturb our discussions this morning or the rest of the day. Uh, the agenda and the program are available. They were probably on your seat, so please uh, look at that to get an idea of what, what we plan to do this, uh, this day. There are there's one significant change. One speaker who was uh, on the program scheduled for the afternoon session, Mr. Saad Rizvi, will be speaking later this morning. Uh, other than that, the program will, will flow as it is printed. Uh, for the morning session, we have focused on the players in education in Pakistan in the public sector as well as the private sector, which includes the for-profit and the non-profit schools. And we will hear a, a hybrid of public-private partnership um, ideas of how they can be developed and successfully implemented. In the afternoon, our speakers um, will be focusing on uh, lessons learned from other experiences uh, and what could be done in madrasa reform, what has been done for reform in Bangladesh and in Punjab, and the relevance of these uh, efforts to what we hope to do in Pakistan. With that, um, I would like to request that questions be reserved until the speakers are done with their presentations for each session. And for the questions, we have printed these 
half-page forms. If you could please write them down and just raise your hand to have a volunteer pick them up. We will screen the questions and then the, the moderator will present the questions to, to the panel or you can direct the questions to one of the speakers. And there may be some limited opportunity to raise your hand and ask follow-up questions uh, from the floor as well. Uh, with that, uh, I think Michael has touched on the, the purpose of this conference. I'd uh, just like to add that the bleak education system really is at the root of many civic society problems in Pakistan. Extremism, poverty, health, low economic output, and these are just a few of them. So TCF was recognized as a Pakistani solution for a Pakistani problem by former Congressman Lee Hamilton, a very well-known personality at the Wilson Center. And we believe that is very true this day as well. TCF feels it, it plays a very important role in finding solutions to the education crisis in Pakistan. And we have worked very hard at developing management expertise for a large and scalable quality education system of formal nonprofit schools. And we are sharing this expertise widely through quality improvement programs with the rest of the country. We are deeply committed to supporting education reform as facilitators of education reform. And this first conference, we hope, will be followed by a second one at the University of California, Berkeley, early next year. And we are working with the Berkeley Pakistan Initiative at UC Berkeley to co-host that conference with us. We hope that we will culminate the series of conferences in Pakistan with uh, similar uh, presentations in Lahore and Karachi. Uh, again, we hope that our speakers will provide valuable insights and we will be asking for their inputs for solutions. We really want to refrain from rehashing the problem that we know so well. The focus of this forum is where education begins, essential education at the primary and secondary levels. Post-secondary education really is a subject for another conference and another forum. We look forward to fresh and innovative ideas from our speakers and presenters and a productive panel discussion leading to concrete steps uh, in turning around Pakistan's education system. With that, I'd like to introduce our morning session moderator, Ms. Aisha Chaudhry, who's currently working um, as a director at an international strategic organization, RICE, Adley Gates. Uh, for, uh, Aisha has also worked at the USAID and uh, in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, she has also been involved uh, at the Brookings Institute as a research analyst, and she's currently a TCF volunteer with the DC chapter and a member of the board of the DC chapter. So with that, I'll turn it over to Aisha Chaudhry. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. We have a great panel this morning, so we've got a lot to get through in the next hour and a half. Uh, our first speaker is Minister Shahid Javed Berkey. Uh, Minister Berkey served as the former finance minister of Pakistan and is currently the CEO of EMP Financial Advisors, as well as a senior scholar here at uh, Woodrow Wilson Center. Previously, Minister Berkey served at the World Bank for 25 years in a number of distinguished positions. And today he will be uh, discussing the right to free and compulsory education bill and its impact. Minister Barkey. Thank you very much, Aisha. And <clears throat> thanks a lot to the organizers, organizers of this session to invite me 
and to start this uh, wonderful operation. Uh, <clears throat> when I was invited to speak, uh, I began to put down some thoughts on a piece of paper. And there is so much to cover in this area. There is so much to talk about. The problem is so severe. Uh, the uh, players that are involved are many uh, that I thought it might be useful to write a short paper uh, <clears throat> just to focus my own attention on the subject, but also to provide those of you who are interested in taking a look at the way I uh, see this particular problem. The problem being uh, very poor uh, education situation, the status of education in the country. Uh, so that paper is available. It's outside. I gave it. I had lunch yesterday with Michael Kugelman, and he suggested that uh, uh, it could be uh, placed outside the table. So those of you who are interested, but I will not read from the paper. I just kind of follow in a very rough way uh, what the paper uh, puts out. In fact, uh, what I'd like to do is uh, very quickly cover four subjects uh, in this uh, brief presentation, 15, 20 minutes, right, Aisha? Uh, and number one, I'd like to discuss the broader role of education in promoting development. It's, uh, I'm an economist. I worked for long years in development economics. As uh, Aisha said, I was at the World Bank for a number of years. So I'm very familiar with the research that has been done. But I will, when I come to the subject in a somewhat greater detail, uh, underscore some of the things that are still not fully understood. And for a country in Pakistan's situation, that I believe is something very, very important to do. Second, I will use a few statistics about the Pakistani situation. Those of you who study education, those of you who are over here, I'm sure, are very familiar with various statistics, but I'll just take half a dozen of them to <clears throat> uh, focus on some of the attributes, uh, some of the aspects of the, of, of the problem. Then uh, uh, when I was, uh, I had telephone conversations with organizers, they asked me to focus on uh, a couple of things. Uh, a law was passed by the National Assembly in 2010 following the adoption of uh, an amendment to the Constitution. And I was asked if I could uh, say something about the relevance of uh, these two or three things to, uh, <clears throat> to solving the problem of education. And at the very outset, I'd like to say that countries and Pakistan, probably more than most countries, take an easy option, which is pass laws, amend constitutions, put out a national policy without really having any intent to do anything about what they say has to be done. So my main conclusion that I will present to you when I come to that aspect is that this is not the right approach. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know whether the organizers of this uh, conference wanted me to come out so brutally against uh, this particular aspect of uh, the country's policy towards education. Uh, then uh, I would like to uh, suggest, and uh, uh, in the opening address, uh, it was said that there needs to be a public-private partnership. I was... Uh, uh, kind of marginally involved in uh, watching, developing and watching a multi-billion dollar program that the World Bank started in Pakistan with enormous amount of fanfare. This was called the Social Action Plan. And uh, it was a number, uh, the bank, because of its uh, prestige in the development circles, was able to organize uh, a number of donors, and this was several billion dollars was to be spent on primary education, primary health care, and so on and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> the problem, uh, the program, as the bank 
admit it. And the bank sel seldom admits that it, it has made a mistake. I was in the bank, so I know how protective it is of uh, what it does. But in this particular case, they came out and they said this was the wrong program. Why? Because money, when it is sent through uh, institutions of the government, which are known to be horribly corrupt, worsen the situation rather than improve it. Just to give you a little bit of anecdote, I was visiting Pakistan, and I was attending a reception in Lahore. And somebody walked up to me, and he said, uh, I gather that you work for the World Bank. I said, yes. And he said, it's a lovely organization. So I said, really? Why, why are you so happy with the World Bank? Because they are paying me to employ my party supporters. <laughs> I said, how did that happen? He said, there's some kind of an education health program. So they've given me a lot of money, and I have employed women and men and so on and so forth, who have nothing to do with education and health and so on. But they are my party workers. They need jobs, and I've given them. So thank you very much. So I came back to Washington, and I told the president of the World Bank of this conversation, Mr. Wolfenson, and he was very, very distressed. So this, these are, I mean, this is just an anecdote uh, to <clears throat> indicate to you the kind of problem that the country faces. Let me now start with uh, the role education plays in changing a country such as Pakistan. Uh, the usual stuff with which all of you are familiar, the conventional wisdom, is that education helps development in many ways. An educated woman becomes more conscious of her body, is uh, able to defend herself against repeated pregnancies, that reduces fertility rate, and so on and so forth. So there is that demogra demographic aspect. Better educated people find better jobs. So you can climb out of poverty into lower middle class and so on. Better education, educated people are more productive. The economists, as you know, when they are analyzing rates of growth, they use two factors. One is population growth, and the other is productivity increases. In Pakistan, population growth <coughs> has been very impressive, too impressive, 2%, 2.5%, 3%. And that, interestingly, is also the rate of growth of the economy these days. In other words, the economy is growing because of the increase in population, not because of changes in productivity. Why is productivity not improving? Because people are not trained enough to make reasonable contribution to the wealth of the society. <clears throat> so I don't want to dwell too much on this. This is, this is a very well-known subject. What social scientists, including people belonging to my profession, economics development, have really not focused on is how the causality runs. What creates what? My opinion is that there are four things, each linked in a very nice causal fashion with the one before. And my way of thinking is, First, education, which then creates a feeling of trust. Trust is something you need to have in order to think beyond your families, in order to go outside your bradri, in order to do more than just client-patron-client relationship. In other words, to become, to trust institutions. And only when you have that, you can begin to develop political, par <coughs> political parties, political processes, and so on. So education leads to trust. Trust leads to political development. And political development leads to economic development. So that's the chain that uh, <clears throat> is very important and something that I've been now working on for some time. This is not conventional wisdom amongst <coughs> economists. I was responsible for China at the World Bank for seven years, and China has developed uh, by uh, not focusing on political development, focusing on economic development, and they've done extremely well. And when I make the kind of argument I made over here, the response is that, well, look at China, look at Korea, look at Taiwan, look at Hong Kong, and so on. These are exceptions that prove the rule. And this is a kind of long story, and we, we can go into this. Why? Uh, economic 
development coming first and political development following later has worked for these countries. But these are exceptions. That's not the rule. The rule, I believe, is education, trust, political development, economic development. So I think this is the way <clears throat> we need to look at the dynamic that education uh, puts out. Very briefly, uh, let me mention half a dozen uh, numbers about uh, the Pakistani uh, uh, edu education situation. These are well known. Uh, net enrollment rate is only 57% for primary education. This is for the year 2013. Two years from 2013, Pakistan was supposed to achieve 100% enrollment rate as a part of uh, Millennium Development Goals. It's way short of that particular uh, event. 7 million children out of 29 million children are not attending schools. There is a wide gender di uh, differences in the provinces. Gender difference in the province of Punjab is the narrowest. Uh, there's, I think, 67% enrollment rate for boys and 64% for women. So a difference of only three percentage point. But where extre extremism is taking hold in Pakistan, in uh, <coughs> northern areas, in federally administered tribal areas, the gender gap is extremely wide. It's something like 20 percentage points. 40% uh, of the boys are in school, but only 15 to 18% of the girls are in school. Those of us who worked in education as development economists know how critical it is to have good buildings and well-provided buildings in order to get children to attend, particularly girls. Parents are very keen, and rightly so, that there should be adequate lavatory facilities. 38% uh, <clears throat> of schools in Pakistan don't have lavatories. 61% don't have electricity. So it's uh, not the kind of environment that one would like to present to the students. One thing that uh, when you read stuff on Pakistan's uh, education, not enough focus is placed on illiteracy. <clears throat> this is a major problem. Ill illiteracy occurs, as you know, when children don't attend schools and they go from one uh, level of schooling to another level of schooling without uh, going to the institutions. And that creates an enormous body of very, very poorly educated people. Pakistan, at this point, has millions of people who can't read and write. But once again, there are very major differences between the provinces. There are only, only the word only should be used with some uh, understanding that only 29% of people in Punjab who are illiterate. But 78% of those in federally administered tribal areas and Baluchistan are illiterate. So you can begin to understand why primitive ideas such as those espoused by Islamic extremists take hold in uh, this kind of situation. I did some work <clears throat> a couple of years ago on what was happening to the education of women in Pakistan. And this was done with the help of an enormous database that has been collected by two well-known economists at Harvard University. And I spent some time every year in Singapore, and I had a Bangladeshi research assistant. And he introduced me to that database. And I said, give me some basic, make some basic tables for me using this data, comparing Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh. So he came back 10 days later with tables. And <clears throat> to my great surprise, I found that Pakistani women, in terms of education, were doing better than Indian women and much better than Bangladeshi women. So I said to this guy, talk to the Harvard people, and let's see what's going on. And what's going on is the role of the private sector, particularly institutions like TCF, which has invested enormously in quality education, focusing on women. 
The second reason is that because these are conservative societies, women don't have uh, much opportunities outside, uh, uh, outside the school, so the dropout rate is the lowest in Pakistan compared to India and, uh, <coughs> and Bangladesh. So girls who enroll in schools stay in the schools till they have achieved what they wanted to achieve. Uh, if you look at statistics of Pakistan, it's very interesting that at the primary level, 40% of the student body is made up of girls. But at the university level, between 50 to 60% of the student body is made up of women. I calculated and then I published somewhere that something like one million highly trained women are now entering the workforce. And a large number of them are able to join modern sectors of the economy. I am involved with the development of the IT sector in Pakistan, and I know how many very well-qualified women engineers have now become IT experts. The usual stuff used to be that women get education, they take uh, spots that should go to men because men educate themselves and enter the workforce. There's a different dynamic working in the case of women. Take the IT sector. <coughs> They join IT firms, spend four, five, six years, get married, leave the job, go to their houses. They have a computer. They sit down in the kitchen. Every middle class family in Pakistan now has somebody sitting outside, a mama, a chacha, a cousin, and so on. And they ask these women to uh, do various things, develop a website or do this, that, and the other and we will pay you. I know people who have done some investigation of this. They call this women-focused cottage industry development in the IT sector. And their calculation is that it hires, that the total employment of this kind of a worker, female worker, is about 200,000. And the total earning by them is of the order of about a billion uh, a year. It doesn't show it, as exports, it is part of the remittances that are coming in. So women have begun to play a very major role. I've talked about laws and policies. Just let me mention three of them and why I don't think this is uh, the route to follow. First, there is the national education policy of, uh, <clears throat> put out by the government of uh, Asif Zardari in 2009. It made the usual kind of promises. Universal primary education by 2015, universal sec secondary education by the year 2025, reform of curriculum, and uh, increased expenditure. Uh, it would go from 2.4% of GDP being spent on education to 7% of GDP being spent on education. Uh, now, as I said before, Government, lazy governments who have really no intention of doing any of this put out these policies in order to deflect the attention from uh, the, some of the things they should be doing. Not surprising, none of these things were done. Uh, increasing education expenditure to 7% of GDP, if that can be done, that would be wonderful, although I think a lot of it would be wasted. There are something like 50,000 ghost schools in Pakistan. These schools get built, but then they are used by landlords as cattle pen and not used for education, but used for a variety of other things. This uh, <coughs> led to uh, well-meaning people who introduced uh, Article 25A into the Constitution. It had uh, a couple of... Uh, uh, Goals, one was compulsory and free education, and the second was that new laws will be put on the books to make sure that what the amendment is saying will get implemented. And then if you read the law, it tells you that uh, 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 parents who don't send their children will be picked up and uh, sent to prison for three months, six months, uh, Entrepreneurs who hire children who, are, who should be in school will be sentenced to six months. Now we know how the judicial system works. 
I know this from personal experience. My family has a land case, which was initiated by my father. He died 20 years ago. Uh, we took it up. I will die before this thing shows any kind of. So with the judicial system working with that awe-inspiring speed, can you imagine that they are going to take up the issue of such and such person has not sent his daughter to school and therefore let's sentence her or him into six years of imprisonment and so on. It ain't going to work. Uh, <clears throat> however, uh, this was an impression was given that uh, by adopting this kind of approach, uh, at least the government was set it, setting itself on the way to some kind of resolution of the problem. Finally, let me say that the only thing that I find that would work in Pakistan is a much, much greater role for the private sector. This can be for both non-profit organizations like TCF as well as for-profit organizations like, take one example, Beacon House School System, which is now one, probably the world's largest school system. I have four or five specific suggestions and then I will leave. Uh, one is <clears throat> that sell the public sector institutions, colleges and universities and towns and cities to the private sector. I, we can go into this in a discussion. I once had a conversation with Shokat Aziz, the former prime minister, and he thought that was a very good idea, but he didn't get very far with that. Establish a private public regulatory body represented by both sides of the uh, system. Support the production of textbooks, create an adult literacy fund, and uh, provide credit to private sectors, in particular to women who are in the education sector and uh, would like to scale up only if they had the money. So in other words, I'll conclude by saying that we need to have a different way of looking at uh, the problem of education, and by looking at it differently, we've got to make it a part of a, a reform that touches many other things, political development, creation of trust, and so on, and put your faith. The country should put its faith in the private sector and in the private sector, particularly on women entrepreneurs. So I'll stop at that. Thank you, Minister Barkey. That was fascinating, and hopefully we'll be able to discuss some of your recommendations in the Q&A. Our next speaker is uh, Jumaina Siddiqui. Uh, she's currently a U.S. Pakistan Program Fellow with uh, the South Asia Center at the Atlantic Council, where her research has focused on efforts by political actors on education reform in Pakistan and the relationship between donors, uh, civil society, politicians, and the government to move these reforms forward. Jemena is also the program manager for Pakistan at the National Democratic Institute. Jemena? Thank you, Aisha. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the Citizens Foundation and the Wilson Center for inviting me to speak at this very important and very timely conference on education reform. I just re uh, returned from a two-week trip to Pakistan, which is never enough when you're discussing any issue in Pakistan. Uh, I was conducting my research, like Aisha mentioned, under the auspices of the Atlantic Council's uh, U.S.-Pakistan program. Um, so as also Aisha mentioned, I'm with the National Democratic Institute. It's my full-time job, so I was doing this fellowship on top of that. Uh, where we, one of the projects that we're implementing is we're working with 11 political parties around the country, uh, training grassroots party members that are district level and below on policy development. The idea is that these party units conduct their own research, training and analysis for the formulation of increasingly responsive and informed platforms and policies, and that parties contribute act actively and um, effectively in the policy making of government institutions, such as legislatures and commissions. Um, so to this end, uh, these policy working groups at NDI has helped to form what these 11 political parties um, that are provincially based 
all identified, we have 20 of them set up thus far, and all have identified education as a key issue for reform. And many of these are district level and below party members, activists. So they are the closest ones to, uh, to see the issues of education and the crisis that schools are facing, uh, both government and private and for-profit schools are facing in Pakistan. Um, and developing these policies, these working groups uh, talk to not only their party members, but also their constituents. So these are responsive. They understand the needs of what's going on with the grassroots, with the people that, you know, that Mr. Bukhari talked about that really need education and to be able to move up from, from, their, from their lower, lower class pover impoverished lives to be able to become productive members of society and uh, the economy. Um, during my trip, I spoke to a number of these policy working groups and party members uh, and discussed the policies that they've drafted as well as reviewing the other policies that I wasn't able to speak with uh, working groups from other uh, provinces. And as uh, Minister Bukhari discussed, they're all rooted in Article 25A of the Constitution and the 18th Amendment, which devolved uh, the education portfolio as a whole to the provinces. Previously, the, uh, the provinces did have a role in the education uh, sector and in overseeing mostly monitoring and evaluation, but now they're also responsible for curriculum development wholesale. Um, and interestingly enough that uh, these issues focused on monitoring and uh, an oversight of schools. No one was talking about curriculum development. A few did. Uh, some were talking about teacher training, but it was really overseeing these schools, these 50,000 ghost schools that, that were just mentioned, and the teachers who, the teacher absenteeism issue, to make sure that teachers are there in schools and they're teaching students. Um, but the, and the monitoring, they, they said, they, they want this on the district level, which then makes the issue of having local government bodies, local government elections imperative if these types of policies are to be implemented on either the provincial assemblies or the national assemblies. Um, in the lead up to the 2013 elections uh, in Pakistan, all the political parties made various promises on education reform. They were looking at the monitoring and accountability issues. Uh, they were calling for the establishment of new bodies to provide this monitoring oversight with regard to access to education, um, and then also increasing the GDP um, that goes towards education, at least 5%, everything everyone mentioned, 5% at a minimum. Some are talking about five, six, seven, eight percent um, adult literacy and numeracy um, and greater teacher training. Um, but I think that the monitoring issue is key on, this dis on the district level. I think no one really talks about that. And uh, some parties talked about, well, during um, the Musharraf era, there were local government bodies and there was more uh, oversight of schools. Teachers were made, it was made sure that teachers were teaching, that there was le less teacher absenteeism that um, you know, enrollment uh, stayed on you know, levels that you know, their children were actually in school. Um, but now, because we don't have local government bodies, um, you know, the, province, the provincial governments are then responsible for monitoring and oversight of all these schools. Um, so I think the key takeaway that I had during my, my conversations in Pakistan was that uh, local government elections are key. There needs to be bodies either have to have elections or set them up through the ministries, but there has to be this district level oversight and monitoring of, of schools because the, pr the provincial government can't do it and of course the national government you know, doesn't have the capacity to, to monitor on this level. Um, and you know, like Minister Booker said that there are infrastructure issues. Everyone I spoke to, these are grassroots district level party members who know what's going on in their schools in their, in their respective areas. And these aren't just from Karachi. Uh, these are you know, party members that represent places like Sukkar and Hyderabad and Dadu and other areas in interior uh, and uh, cities close to the border with Balochistan. And you know, they, they indeed said that there are tons of ghost schools out there that are being used as sheds or being rented out by landlords. Um, and there's hardly any basic infrastructure, no, no functioning toilets, no desks, no electricity, no running water. Um, but it's not an issue of funds. 
And in 2013 to 2014, the education budget for SIN was about 135 billion rupees. 90% uh, of this is allocated to cover mainly teacher salaries and the maintenance of schools with the rest uh, going to development or uh, investment in existing schools. Uh, the split for KP and Punjab were about 80% to um, the maintenance of schools with 20% going into investment. Balochistan's uh, divide was about 70% to 30%. Um, and that's the thing, like when in these conversations you think, oh wow, that much going to teacher salaries. Government teachers are actually paid a lot more than teachers in private schools in Pakistan. Um, and they're, and when I heard that, I was like, well, that's interesting. You know, what are their criteria for these teachers? There's, there's no minimum criteria for teachers. You know, they hear you have to have at least a, a bachelor's or a master's in education or in the subject that you're teaching. Nothing. Many of these teachers have been teaching for 20 something years and just have, you know, a metric, you know, tw past 10th grade or maybe hardly 12th grade and are teaching. And so when new curricula are introduced in these schools, they don't know how to teach these new, new progressive curriculums that are introduced by the government. Um, but when it goes to the expenditure issue, going back, um, it's a different story that even, you know, the 90% say that's uh, allocated for SIN to cover the maintenance of schools and teacher salaries, that's spent. But this, this 20% or 10% um, that goes to development, these are hardly spent. They're, I think, consistently underspent in Pakistan. And that money could be going towards teacher training to upgrade, new, upgrade schools, to build libraries, to build play, playgrounds. Many of these schools, the government schools, are required to have, you know, at least adequate, you know, areas for a play area for students, these primary and secondary schools. Uh, some of the, um, the private schools that just kind of pop up within, like, you know, houses or apartment buildings, it's, you have 20 kids in, in a one-room apartment and they're teaching them. And there's no criteria for ensuring that there's a library or adequate facilities or a play area for these children. Um, and so the international donor community is um, looking at these issues. They are heavily investing. Um, the United Kingdom has, from uh, between 2009 and through 2000, uh, two th uh, 2019, has committed almost a billion dollars to education reform uh, in Pakistan. And since 2009, the U.S. government has committed over $800 million uh, to date for education reform. However, this is, you know, you don't, you're hardly seeing the difference. And I think it is a capacity issue. Provinces are now mandated to, as I've said, to, to address the education issue, but there's no capacity. Either, you know, people who have portfolios in ministries of education or working on education issues don't have a background in education. They don't understand methodology, teaching methodologies. Uh, they don't understand pedagogy. So I think, you know, that's, that's something that definitely needs to be addressed as we look at uh, both donor investment in education in Pakistan, as well as appointments to ministries of education. Um, and the inter, like uh, as I should mention, I also looked at the interaction between the donor community and political parties and elected officials. There's none. There are attempts to work with political parties. I think it's a uh, it's problematic. I think you know the donors do want to reach out to them, um, but because international development assistance is still run through the foreign office in Islamabad, but then education ministries are then responsible for implementation. There's this disconnect. So usually provincial uh, level ministers of education or provincial level uh, directors in the education ministries um, are not at the table when discussions are being had about how to spend. Uh, funds on education, more than needs of each province. And each province has different needs. And interestingly enough, in this current government, each province is being run by a different political party. So that makes the dynamic all uh, even more interesting. Um, uh, however, when I was out there in Islamabad, I was very uh, pleased to know that um, the development partners in Islamabad that are funding education have started to coalesce and have are having regular meetings. I, and they're hoping to set up a secretariat, which is a step in the right direction. Uh, I think something that needs to be made sure is that it's not just folks in Islamabad 
and it's not just ministry, uh, provincial ministers that are at the table when these discussions are being had about how to spend development dollars or pounds uh, uh, in, in the education reform, but you need to have civil society organizations, and it can't be the civil society organizations that are based in Islamabad. You have to reach out to the ones that are out in the provinces. There's some amazing work being done in Southern Punjab by the book group where they've adopted government schools. <coughs> Folks like that, private sector, it needs to be at the table as well as, along with CSOs and education experts. <coughs> so there's a real lack of education expertise who have, who have done training either in the US or abroad on you know, teaching methodologies, teacher training issues, how children learn, how adults learn. That type of work is, it's, beginning to happen in Pakistan, but we have definitely have a long way to go. Um, I think that one mechanism I found very interesting um, was the Global Partnership for Education. And they actually have this model. They have consultations, and their board is comprised of donors, NGOs, governments, private foundations, and teacher organizations. Uh, they're uh, supporting um, to implement parts of both Sindh and Balochistan's provincial education policy. Um, with the commitment of a supervising entity. So they're not just handing the money over to both, to both provincial governments. There is a supervising entity, in, case, in this case the World Bank, and then there is a coordinating agency, UNICEF. So there is oversight, there is technical assistance being provided to both provinces in the grants that they're receiving. Sindh is getting 66 million um, from GPE and uh, Balochistan is receiving 34 million. So I think these types of models need to be implemented broadly where there is M more consensus and more stakeholders at the table making these decisions. Um, something I found when I was out there um, that's missing from the discourse, like I said, is te teaching methodologies, but also curriculum development. You know, the, you know, so like social security is the third rail of politics in the <laughs> United States. Education is the third rail for Pakistani politics because there's just so many contentious issues. Do you teach civic education? How do you teach civic education? How should you teach math and science in Pakistan? How should you should teach Pakistan studies and Islamic studies? So it is really a contentious issue. And like I said, with each province being uh, governed by a different political party and these prov provincial governments now responsible for curriculum development, I really do worry about the types of curriculum that will be developed by, by the um, ministries of education. Um, as they, like I said, are now responsible for the education function wholesale. Um, one suggestion, which I think I agree with as well, um, actually a couple of people made the suggestion that perhaps reverting some of the curriculum development mandate back to the national government and having a framework. I'm not saying that the, the national government should say, this is exactly what you teach, but at least have some guiding principles for provincial ministries to work with as they develop curriculum. Um, and, you know, it, also understanding that, you know, children not, children not just in Pakistan, but everywhere learn differently. And, you know, not all of them are gonna go to college. So really focus on vocational training, which is done ad hoc in Pakistan, but some of the parties in their platforms to discuss greater <coughs> investment in vocational training. So that's something else to think about. Uh, as we look at how we reform education in Pakistan. Um, projects like Ilm Ideas, which is a DFID funded project, um, is incubating and piling innovative ideas on teaching methodology, on curriculum. So I think part development partners should coordinate with these projects, build upon them. It's, I've worked in development for a couple, number of years now, and no one really does you know, look back and learn from what they've done in previous projects. So this is, Projects like Ilm Ideas is a way to, to build upon things that work and um, making sure that something that, but then also just putting things in cookie cutter and saying if it worked in, in, Punjab, in Northern Punjab, that's definitely gonna work in interior sin, it's not. But taking a basic framework approach and understanding that this is a good idea, let's pilot it and test it. I think development funds don't go towards that. And I don't even think the government of Pakistan thinks about piloting projects in this way where they, um, they're always waiting for additional funds to be able to implement these projects. Um, I know Minister Bukri had said that the private sector should be involved and, uh, in, in the education sector, and it is true. There, there should be public-private partnerships, but um, <coughs> coming from a democracy and governance background, I was frankly very disappointed to hear so many people tell me that 
the government of Pakistan should get out of the business of education. They can facilitate, but when it comes to education, let's hand it over to the private sector. Um, and, you know, it's, it's an interesting concept. Maybe we pilot it somewhere. But if you start taking away service delivery mandates from the government, what's next? You take education away. Is health next? Is uh, sanitation next? You know, what, you know, where, where is it? It's a slippery slope. And I think if the, this is the idea is, you know, Pakistan wants to go forward and, and privatize education, it needs to be done slowly and incrementally. Learn from what's worked, learn from what hasn't worked, and then continue, you know, this hopefully a hybrid model where we're not just shutting down government schools or having a company, you know, come in like Google, since there's a Google school right here, or, uh, you know, Coca Cola is, you know, sponsoring schools uh, around, um, around the country. Um, and I think I'll, um, I was also asked to talk about the Sindh education sector plan. It's a massive document. It's 350 pages. It's one of those everything in the kitchen sink. And I admire them for doing this. This is the first time that the government of Sindh has put together a comprehensive four-year education plan. I think that some of the shortcomings, however, is that, um, well, let me talk about the positives. They actually look at outcomes rather than inputs. They've really taken a very systematic approach in developing this document. Um, but I think the understanding of, you know, a give and take of what they can afford to do and what they can't afford to do, that thought process hasn't taken place yet. I think it's, it's like I said, it's incremental. So um, it's a great endeavor. It's a great effort. It's a really, it, I, it's a long document, but I suggest you read it or at least, you know, the summaries of it. Um, and Think about how I think the government of Sindh and, and Balochistan as well, and I think other provinces are in the process of putting together their education plans, really focus on key priority issues and fund those, whether it's international assistance funds, whether it's the own government's funds, but really take a strategic approach um, and get together. You know, if all four provincial education ministers can sit down at the table and discuss, this is what we're looking at funding. What's worked in your province, what hasn't? Um, and I think in this climate, it's a little bit more difficult because each province, like I said, is being run by a different political party. And with the, the situation in Pakistan right now, uh, these types of dialogues are difficult, but they're necessary. Um, and uh, as just a couple of concrete steps uh, for ref in the reform process, um, I, I have a few suggestions. I think there needs to be continued and substantive coordination between donors, implementing partners, national, provincial governments, and elected officials. Uh, what has been missing in the current conversation is the participation of elected officials who have the ability to make changes to outdated rules, regulations, policies, laws. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, I'll just wrap up. Uh, to, and so this is, um, I think this, this continued coordination, which the uh, USAID, I think, is taking the lead right now in Pakistan, is, um, is a good step in the right direction. Uh, like I said, having the government uh, play a role in cr the curriculum development framework. Um, and then I think my uh, last uh, two points are that uh, when countries like the United States and the United Kingdom have high-level substantive talks, there should be substantive talks on as well, not on the side, but actual on the on the agenda about social issue, education, issue, social issues like education. Um, we're not asking you know donor governments to say uh, this is what you should teach, but we should be helping them and supporting them in their decision making process as to what to teach. Um, I just want to end on one final thought, um, an idea that came up when I was having my conversations in Pakistan. Um, for all the discourse on education reform being held today, and that has been held and will be held in the future, um, and it won't matter until education reform is made up into a political issue. Basically that if you don't talk about education reform as uh, someone running for office or as an elected official, your seat is in jeopardy. You should not, you know, it should be a key issue in any discussion you have when you're going around to your district and, and running for office or trying to maintain your office. Um, it might seem naive to someone you know, going around and having you know, members of the National Assembly talk about education reform and actually visiting schools, but there's not going to be meaningful and substantive reform until citizens understand that 
um, their elected officials, elected officials are accountable to the citizens, not the other way around, and that they hold the power to vote out a government at the ballot box if they don't see progress on issues. Um, thank you. Thank you, Jimena. That was really interesting. I, when I was at USAID in 2011 was when the devolution policy happened, so it's interesting to see your perspective three years later. Um, just a reminder, if you have questions, please submit this form uh, to Amjid or one of our volunteers so we can uh, get that going for the Q&A session. And we're actually going to have Saad Rizvi next um, instead of Daniel. Saad needs to, to leave us uh, sooner. Uh, Saad is at Pearson's, where he leads a global team to improve and deliver, deliver educational outcomes. He also advises systems on delivery, education policy, and large-scale reform across Asia, Europe, Africa, and North America. And he will be discussing the Punjab Education Reform initiatives, Initiative and lessons from other provinces in Pakistan. Saad? I have a presentation, so let me just put that up. Okay, good. So, so first of all, thank you so much for the organizers for having me here. It's, uh, it's a real privilege to be here. The Citizens Foundation is an organization that over the years I tremendously admire, both personally as well as professionally. And I've had the privilege of working closely with the Citizens Foundation in Pakistan over, uh, over the last couple of years. The impact both on their own students but also on uh, broader education policy and debate is, is remarkable. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we, as we go on. So today I'll talk about the Punjab Education Roadmap, uh, which is a specific reform initiative uh, targeted in Punjab, started four years ago, and is now extended to KPK as well. Um, the origins of the roadmap were back in 2009, end of 2009, start of 2010, the British and Pakistani governments decided to uh, start tackling the education emergency in Pakistan and they established this thing called the Pakistan Education Task Force. It was a bilateral body aimed at looking at uh, what are the challenges in education in Pakistan and what can be practically done to counteract those challenges. Uh, initially, this was pre-18th Amendment. This was at the federal level. And I uh, was on the team that was on the task force, helped start run it. And then I'll talk about how, how that evolved as, as things proceeded. Um, very soon after we started establishing the task force and, and, and looked at what are the challenges facing education in Pakistan, the 18th Amendment was passed, which meant uh, the, the responsibility for implementation of education reform was now with the provinces. So then we went to different provinces around the country and said, okay, we have this, uh, we have both the resources as well as international expertise backing uh, some reform efforts. Who wants to take up this offer for, uh, for support? And, uh, uh, several provinces were interested, but the Punjab government was the most excited and enthusiastic about it. And so that uh, led to the start of the roadmap that, that was around four years ago. Uh, one thing before I go into the roadmap is I want to uh, emphasize what, uh, what Mr. Berkey has talked about, uh, which, is, which has been our philosophy with this whole reform effort. Uh, policy, passing laws, talking about it. It's really important, but it's only, I would say, 5 to 10% of the work. It's really easy to pass a good education policy. There's brilliant people all over the world who figured out what works and what doesn't work in, in education. 95% of the work is all about relentless implementation. It's about making something out of that policy, making sure it's working, and, and improving as you go along. So, so I, I appreciate what you said, and, and, and that's exactly the approach we took. Uh, so when we started work in Punjab, uh, I was, back, I was in McKinsey's education practice at the time. I'd worked in several countries in education reform. And so when we started out, um, we took the existing body of evidence that was around the world in, in education and said, what, how can we apply this to Pakistan? And if you look at uh, education around the world, 
it's very clear. Everyone knows what needs to be done in a system in a particular journey. If you're a poor to fair system, which is what Pakistan is, you really need to focus on achieving the basics of literacy and numeracy. You can't think about uh, smart boards and, and digital technology. Just make sure there's a teacher in the class teaching the basics of literacy and numeracy. If you want to do even better, focus on getting the foundations in place for a good education system. So depending on where a system is in the journey, you have to cater the intervention according to that. And, um, and then similarly, we know from, from decades of education reform what makes a good education system. It's not, it's not rocket science. Everyone knows that if you have the right standards and accountability, and by standards I mean globally benchmark standards, if you have good data, uh, if you have the agenda that every child should have access to a good education, not just, uh, not just the elite or, or well-to-do sector, that's, that's what you need to start a good education system. You need to focus on human capital, both teachers as well as the broader government departments, and you need to focus on the structures and organizations that are essential for uh, sustainability of the change in the long term. So this is, this is something that has worked in a lot of countries, and we said, okay, let's take this and see how we can apply this to Pakistan and apply this to uh, Punjab's education sector as a starting point. So we spent a little bit of time on diagnosis, basically a month. As I said, policy is only 10% of, of the journey, and said, let's develop this, this roadmap, this action plan uh, aimed at really dramatically improving the, the education sector in Punjab, and that means both the public and private sector. Uh, and we came up with this roadmap. This was in partnership, obviously, with the Pakistani government, with the civil society, the donors. Uh, DFID was, uh, was a key partner in this whole project, and, is, and still is. And the elements of the roadmap basically are, there's two elements of the roadmap. One is whole system reform, which is how do you take globally benchmarked, globally proven examples of improving education systems and infuse that into Punjab. And the second element is uh, something around systemic innovation. How do you get the basics right, but then how do you make sure that uh, the system is constantly innovating, improving, kind of breaking the, breaking the ceiling? The elements of whole system reform, firstly, data and targets. I'll talk a lot about data and, and targets because it's a very data-driven approach. Uh, uh, Jumaima talked about the importance of data, and I'll talk about how there is data at the district level. There is data at the every school, every student level uh, across the province being collected right now. It's just about using that effectively and bringing it to the attention of people who make decisions. So data and targets was the, basically the cornerstone of the, of the work. The second thing was around district administration. Uh, there's a massive bureaucracy working on education in Pakistan. The government employs more people in education than any other department, at least in Punjab. I'm sure it's the same at a federal level as well. So how do you energize that sector to have the same ethos, the same accountability that you see in the private sector and, and in the not-for-profit sector? So energizing district administration. Then teacher quality. There's 300,000 public school teachers in Punjab um, of variable quality. Some are amazing teachers. Some don't even show up like, like uh, someone referenced earlier today. So how do you make sure every teacher is showing up to school in the first place and then delivering good basic education. Then there's the enrollment drive. Uh, uh, Burki Saab talk about, uh, talked about the huge number of people who are outside of, of the system in Pakistan. Um, it's not a question of people not coming to school. The enrollment problem in Pakistan is more of a dropout problem. Everyone comes and enrolls their kids into grade one. I think around 80 to 90 percent of, of students get enrolled in grade one. And then next year, 60 percent of them drop off. So people want their kids to be educated. They enter the system, they say, look, they're not really uh, getting uh, a return on investment for their time, and they drop out. So the enrollment problem is more of a dropout problem. How do you make sure once people come to school, uh, they're not disappointed and they don't drop out and they don't uh, go work in the fields instead? And then a series of supporting programs. The systemic innovation piece of the roadmap was firstly the Punjab Education Foundation. Uh, I agree with Mr. Berkey that the public-private partnerships is a huge uh, part of the solution. It doesn't replace the public sector. It's, it's all, often a false dichotomy that people say, oh, should we go with the public sector or the private sector? We don't have to make that choice. It's about both the sectors working together, collaborating, and, and, uh, and having a collective impact together. The Punjab Education Foundation 
established uh, a long time ago, and we helped expand and grow it. Basically, what it does is it provides vouchers for people in low cost uh, from in, uh, vouchers for people to be redeemed in low cost private schools. So it's a way of government channeling uh, government funds towards the private sector and getting a much higher return on investment, particularly in far to reach areas. So for example, if you're uh, if you're opening a school in a in a village in uh, in the south of Punjab, which is really far away. If you, if you were to open a government school, you would need to have a library, all of those, a playground, all of those requirements, uh, which are great. But a private s sector player can go and establish that school without the same overhead, without the same bureaucracy, without the same uh, conditions that the government would have to go through. So the Punjab Education Foundation helps funds those kind of entrepreneurs to set up uh, low-cost private schools with the, with the right level of quality uh, assurance role played by the government. And now it's expanded to several million children across Punjab. Media campaign was a big part of it. Uh, Jumaiba mentioned the need for making education an essential part of uh, the electoral debate, the political debate. And we launched a massive media drive across Pakistan back in 2011. It reached 100 million people across the province, and it did make education one of the primary issues in, in the last election. That was the goal of the media drive, and I'm, uh, I'm happy to say we, we did achieve that to some extent. Education, uh, once we ran the surveys, education was one of the primary topics of the last election. And then the innovation fund. Uh, uh, Jumaima mentioned the, this as well. It's, it's called Ilma Ideas. We set it up in partnership with DFID to basically source out what are the innovations uh, that can provide a step change in education in, in Pakistan. It's not just Punjab focused, so that we can fund those entrepreneurs and scale those innovations at a systematic level. And there's been interesting ideas of us uh, picking new technologies from this and plugging them into the into the public sector. So once again, the idea of public-private partnerships. So these are the elements of the roadmap. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the approach of the roadmap. So as I mentioned, data is the most important cornerstone of, of making these reforms work. And by data, I don't mean um, randomized control trials. I don't mean waiting for three years to figure out whether something is working. I mean data on a monthly basis that can drive management decisions. One of the first things we had to do was uh, re-energize the data collection mechanism of, of the whole government. Uh, and the way we did this was actually building on a World Bank in, in, uh, founded institution called PMIU that has uh, 900 ex-army officers who have motorbikes and they go from school to school to school with a, with a uh, blank piece of paper and they collect key indicators like how many teachers are showing up, how many students are showing up, what's the enrollment rate, was there electricity at the school, um, are there functioning toilets, um, do, if, does every student have a book, those kind of key indicators. These guys collect that ind those indicators on a monthly basis, they're tabulated, they're centralized, and then they're used to drive management decisions. So the first step in the approach was to uh, establish this data system, which allows us on the 10th of every month to figure out what's happening in each one of 60,000 schools across the province. Uh, which, one, which teachers are showing up, which teachers aren't showing up, which ones are go schools, which ones aren't. And that's the cornerstone of, of, of the whole work. Um, the data is not perfect. Uh, there's definitely corruption. There's definitely some, uh, some changes in it, but we don't need it to be perfect. As long as it's 80% accurate, that's good enough to drive management decisions at the provincial level, and that's all we care about. In KPK, where we are now replicating this approach, we've taken it a step further where we have uh, a completely automated solution. So I, I can, for example, log into my portal right now and I can figure out how many students are present in every school in KPK <laughs> today, which is uh, a really amazing system and it's now helping drive the same changes in KPK. Uh, so targets, once again, uh, the, the data, once we had the data up and running, the next step was to set aspirational targets for each of these indicators. So this one shows, uh, I, I'm, I don't think everyone can see this, so I'll just talk to it. This one shows the target that we set for student attendance. How do you, uh, how do you go from 80% to like 87%, which, which is kind of a reasonable target based on what we've seen in Brazil and India and other places? And how do we, uh, what, what does that mean for every quarter? So having targets that are ambitious, but achievable, and uh, sent to ev not just uh, 
the provincial education minister, but every particular district had their own targets, had their own indicators, which are once again being monitored on a monthly basis. The targets were, were really imp a really important part of this. The cornerstone of this was this education stock take meeting. Uh, I'm, I'm showing a picture from the Punjab stock take. The same thing now happens in KPK uh, every six weeks. And this meeting is really uh, a great forum for all the education uh, stakeholders. And this includes the civil society. There's, you can probably see someone from USAID uh, sitting over there. Um, the education department who come together on a monthly basis, look at the data, debate the issue, make decisions on the spot. So this was kind of like the engine to drive change on an ongoing basis. So an example of this is um, once we started the enrollment drive, we realized that, look, in some districts, you're getting much better enrollment because of the drive compared to other districts. <coughs> Said, okay, let's go and figure out what's happening. We found out that uh, enrollment really works if uh, there's three people who are, who are talking about enrollment. The, the education district managers, of course, uh, the muazzin of the local mosque, because when people come to pray, they're told, why don't you send your daughter to school? And then the barber, uh, because when people are getting their hair cut, they, and then the barber is telling them, uh, you should send your daughter to school. Or when people are getting their beards trimmed and the barber is telling them, you should send your daughter to school, that's what makes a difference. And so in this meeting, we said, let's scale this program across all 36 districts. So that's how this meeting was used to is being used to make real decisions on a very ongoing dynamic basis, which is what's needed in these programs. Uh, data is presented in a very easy to, easy to read format. So this is an example of the type of heat maps that we would use to uh, solve problems in those meetings. Teacher presence, all right, it looks good. Everything's on target overall. There's a problem in Bhakkar. Let's, let's solve this problem. Let's figure out what's going on. Uh, student attendance. So this is, these are just representative, but it gives you an idea of how we were using data to zoom in on problems and solve them uh, on an ongoing basis. The Chief Minister of Punjab, uh, Shahbaz Sharif, once said in a meeting that I sleep with these under my pillow every night because that's, that's how important they are to me. So it's like uh, data was really important. And then once again, after the meeting, we would take that data and send that back to the districts to help them make uh, decisions accordingly as well. So for example, this is a district's report that was sent back to Bhawalpur after a stock take that told them, look, you're doing well on teacher presence, but you still need 25 more teachers to come to your schools on a, on a regular basis. So very granular, practical uh, way of, of driving things forward. Um, the one other thing that we did was, uh, we also, I, I'm not going to go into details, but we ran programs for training 300,000 teachers across the province. Uh, we had new pub textbooks republished. We made sure that every teacher had a teacher guide in, in school. And that's where the Citizens Foundation was really, really generous in their, in their collaboration with us because uh, I'm sure Daniel might mention this, but the Citizens Foundation has, some, has amazing books and teacher guides that are given to every school. And, um, they were because they were a partner in this work. They really opened up their their intellectual property and said, "Look, you can take our stuff, use it." And uh, these these uh, materials were really instrumental in developing materials for the public sector, which have which are now and uh, have reached millions of children. So, so thank you to the Citizens Foundation for that. The results. So it's a, it's an ongoing work. It's it's improving, but uh, we have seen a step change in results in Punjab and are starting to see that in KPK. Um, higher enrollment and, and attendance, uh, a huge cut down on, on ghost schools, but also ghost workers and ghost teachers and ghost students, uh, which are all equally important problems. More teachers attending than ever before, more schools with basic health, basic facilities such as electricity and toilets and so on, and a stronger administration focused on quality results. Um, so for example, in, uh, when we started, there were around 22 to 22% of district officials who would actually visit schools. So these are people whose job it is to visit schools. Uh, only 22% would visit them in any given month. Now it's up to 96%. It's, it's, it's basic management stuff. If you're paid to do a job, you're supposed to do it, and this is ensuring that that's done. Um, we have one and a half million extra children enrolled in, uh, in public schools. This is data that's uh, verified by Nielsen independent surveyors. We know that, uh, uh, and we try to triangulate data from different sources just to make sure it's fine. So this is Nielsen verified data. 
The biggest challenge, uh, and uh, <coughs> several people have mentioned this before, the challenges aren't over. The biggest challenge is still in southern Punjab. It's like the southern Punjab, the rural Punjab, particularly for, uh, for girls. And that's, that's what we are trying to really focus our effort on because, once again, the data shows that if we focus on this particular sector, that's where we'll get the biggest jump in and biggest uh, return on investment. Student attendance going up from 80 to 90 percent. The other interesting thing that uh, uh, things like this teach you is, is how to account for uh, different seasonal variations in data. So whenever even the student attendance is going up, whenever there's a harvest season, it, it plummets because students are taken out of school to help on the fields and, and so on. And the answer is not necessarily how do we stop that from happening. The answer is how do we adapt the system to, to support people for whom this is a necessity. Teacher presence has gone up from 80 to 90 percent. Um, this does not include um, excused absences. This is unexcused absences. Um, but it means 37,000 extra teachers are showing up to school every day than they were before. Uh, now the focus is on teacher quality. Um, it's, it's about how, once you ensure that a teacher is showing up, and is standing there in front of students. That's, that's the basic. You can't get anything without that. The next step is how do you make sure they're teaching uh, in a high quality way. And so we're we are running pilots for scaling up teacher quality uh, and teacher effectiveness. Uh, now, it's, it's uh, as I mentioned, we started the same work in KPK now as well. It's in the earlier stages. And uh, we're establishing the data systems and have started making some real progress. Uh, but I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the big lessons of, of this work and the roadmap and implications for other provinces uh, and other countries who want to take the same approach. The first one is to, is to be really bold, to be really ambitious. Um, the country has had several, several failed five-year plans, 10-year plans in education and so on, which haven't had any impact. It's, it's really important to focus on how do we change facts on the ground today as opposed to in five years. So you have to be really bold. Set clear goals. And by clear goals, I mean um, it's, it, the MDGs are very aspirational and, and go, goal and have had a lot of impact. But I think the goals for real implementation need to be clearer, need to, need to say what should be the target for student attendance next quarter and the quarter after that and the quarter after that and leading up to the MDG. So you need to set very clear, tangible, practical goals. Prepare, plan, and get on with it. You can refine as you go. Don't try to develop a perfect plan. Just have something that's good enough, go with it, and iterate it as you go along. It's kind of like the same lean startup methodology that's being taken up in, in the business world. Uh, think of that approach and how you can apply that to education reform, iteratively improving the plans. Establish routines that work. So routines are really important to uh, the stock take meeting I mentioned was like a monthly meeting that happens regardless of, of what's going on. There was a dengue crisis in Pakistan that was obviously really important. But um, when there's a dengue crisis or when there are floods in Pakistan, they don't improve the education system. So the education system reform has to be built on routines that go on even if there's a crisis, even if there's dengue, because that's, that's what you need to get momentum. Data, once again, data is the cornerstone of, of the work. Data helps you have really honest conversations. It lets you, you know, go beyond saying, look, I think there's a lot of go schools to saying there's 15 go schools in this district that need to be fixed by next month. So, so and that helps you have that conversation. It helps you know what's really happening on the ground as opposed to using anecdotal evidence and, and, and kind of theoretical uh, conversations. Uh, data helps you refine your plans on a very ongoing basis. So you might, uh, uh, using the same example of, of, uh, of teacher attendance, you might uh, realize that there's uh, a, 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 a very significant problem in one particular district that the current plans are not addressing. But having data at the student level, at the teacher level, helps you refine your plans as you go along, as opposed to being stuck with a five-year plan that's going to be obsolete in three. Um, Data helps you create momentum. It helps you like win, win over both political, uh, uh, both political support as well as the support of the social sector, the civil society, and so on. And the third piece of it is never relent. It, this, is, this is a long haul. This is not a fancy policy paper that you can write in, in a month and, and, uh, and feel good about it. This is like relentless implementation, the grind of implementation that takes years and years of work to have impact. 
uh, it's important to have a guiding coalition. This means people who will come and support you when you're in trouble, people who, will, uh, who are all behind a, a, simp a, a single plan and a single effort. A practical example of how this was useful, as I mentioned, we were running a media campaign uh, and, and had good and have good relationships with, uh, with the different media houses in Pakistan to promote education efforts. Uh, one, one thing that very commonly happens is uh, if someone in Pakistan publishes a new book, that person would find a reporter and then go to the education department and say, look, this book needs to be in all the libraries in your system, which would mean you know, a lot of money for that publisher. And if it's not in all these libraries, this reporter is going to say that your school has a cow tied into it instead of students. So this is like real blackmail that happens in, in, uh, in the system. And there's different forms of corruption. But if you have a guiding coalition, I was sitting when one of that examples happened. We could call the CEO of that media company and said, look, this is what your reporter is doing. Can you, can you get uh, behind the reform efforts as opposed to stopping them? So a guiding coalition helps you solve those kind of problems. Focus on the change that, that's needed. Often the focus is often on uh, how much money is needed, how much, what percentage of GDP should education be. That's important, but let's focus on the change first. Let's talk about the 7 million children that are out of school and how much it would cost to get them into school through public, private, or, or other means, and then get to the money. Let's not just throw out wild numbers, because what's interesting is even if you take the money that's being spent right now, and you reduce wastage in the system to 0%, which is impractical. But suppose you do it. That's going to be more than enough to fund everything. So let's focus on the change that's needed. Let's focus on plugging the gaps, strengthening the system, and then talk about money. And then final lesson, when in doubt, go back to data. Uh, I know I've been harping on about this for a while, but if you have the right systems, if you have real-time data, it just solves so many problems, and it makes life so much easier. So that's the roadmap. Uh, as I mentioned, we are doing this in KPK. It's a live effort. If, if uh, anyone wants to be involved, get plugged in, uh, whether in Punjab or KPK, happy to, happy to do that. It's, it's uh, the most uh, um, satisfying work I've ever done. It's also the most emotionally draining, but it's, it's really exciting. So if anyone wants to get involved, feel free to get in touch with me as well. Thank you. Thank you, Saad. Uh, I remember when your McKinsey team came to brief me when I was at USAID, and there was this much data uh, that they that they told us about. So it's it's nice to see that there's been significant progress. I think it's a coffee break now for 10, 10 15 minutes. Ten minutes. Let's ten, ten. ten minutes. Um, so we'll see you back here in ten minutes. Thank you.